Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. Hey, how's it going? What do you know? Strike like Clayton here from XY Advisor, and today I'm chatting with Daniel. Mate, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, big things happening. Big, big things. So uh, you've recently become a a morning star, part of the uh, extended global network. I am. That's awesome, man. Let's talk a little bit about uh, you. You're starting out in advice. Um, about 10, 12 years ago. And, uh, or did you start out in advice earlier than that? About 20 years ago. Okay. So you advice 20 years ago. That's it. And then, so you're an advisor for a guess about almost a decade. Um, a little bit yeah, less, but yeah, that's, um, yep. That makes sense. Quite a few years. And then at this stage, you go, actually, we need better software. And so what, what we like, was it you and a mate, or how did it how did it roll out? Um, yeah, my my business partner. So we were out there running our financial planning practice. Um, we got an AFSL, sort of early in FSR, and like everyone else, we were going to take over the world. Yeah, we'll have a couple of um, external authorized reps um, next week, four the week after, eight the week after. Naturally, pretty soon we'll be taking on the big boys. <laughs> so uh, how are we going to manage all of that? <laughs> Let's go grab some software. Um, so we did get some software, and there was some. Pretty good stuff, some functional stuff that's still out there today. Um, I'm sure everyone um, knows it. <laughs> um, but we just found it a little bit difficult to use um, and quite expensive to um, just maintain and, and to develop um, for our practice. And as sort of a, as arrogant as I am today, I was that much uh, more arrogant back then. And we sort of, my partner and I looked at each other and said, well, we'll just go build our own. Why not? How difficult could that be? <laughs> um, and, 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 and so Advisor Logic was born. Um, it, the way that I, because uh, many years ago, I actually interviewed Julian Plummer from uh, Midwinter. Mm-hmm. And the way that he talks about it was, you know, he had an Excel spreadsheet and uh, basically started with that. So how did, how did, how did you guys start? We had a couple of uh, developers that we found right. um, that were keen to get to work and had a bit of experience um, in the field previously. And we just started throwing ideas at them and, um, and putting something together. Yeah, okay. It's sort of, if you make the decision to go down the path of software, it's kind of crazy how quickly you can get wrapped up in everything, isn't it? I mean, today I think it's even easier to get started. But, yeah, uh, that's yeah, a really it was, good uh, point. We, we, we started um, digging that hole for ourselves um, pretty early and um, we were getting something that we could use for, for our own practice. I mean, that was in, in, initially that's all we had in mind that for our practice and, and for our, right. our, our, you know, you can't see the um, air quotes here, but our dealer group, yeah, um, we'd we'd be uh, we'd, we'd have this software, um, and at some point we kind of realised, well, this is going to need a bit more investment um, of time and money than we can give it and manage a financial services business. Uh, we're going to have to give something up, and we decided, well, we think we can actually take this to market. Some other people will benefit, so we sold off the financial services business and, and went full time into um, software. Yeah, a lot of times when people are building software, they're trying to solve their own problem originally. So what kind of advice were you delivering that you felt required a new piece of custom uh, tech? We um, Most of our clients are wealth accumulators. And most of the software in the market, I think all of the software in the market, had really started off as a cash flow model. And CRM was an afterthought. It was something that was tacked onto the back of, of a cash flow model. Uh, we really saw it differently. The most important thing to us was that we knew our clients, that we could look at one screen and understand exactly who they are, what they've got, what what they want. Um, so we really built it with the know your client at the core, and then all the other features are sort of built out of that core. Yeah, right. And so working with wealth accumulators, and and did you say you were focusing on cash flow 
at that stage? No, not yet. Okay, yeah. Because cash flow is one of those things that uh, I got into very quickly as soon as I opened my own company. Uh, and this, uh, this client came in and they said, thanks for all of this investment help, Clayton, the insurances and the superannuation and the structuring. And, but that's all future focused. And I remember him very clearly just looking across the table at me and saying, what can you do for me now? That helps my life now. Right. And I was like, ah, Jesus, uh, it's kind of put me on the spot, but uh, I kind of went away and somehow ended up implementing a cash flow system that I'd been using for myself for many years. And that's kind of how I got into cash flow. That's kind of how um, I ended up sort of sharing with other advisors how to do it. And it's, it's kind of cool to see cash flow being a big part of advice nowadays. But before all of that sort of trend started, you kicked off a piece of software. And what were you trying to, I guess, improve on compared to what was in the market? Uh, usability was first and foremost. So conf- usability, configurability, things that were taking us sort of seven or eight clicks to get to in the other software where you kind of had to know the trick of how to find it. Like the function was there. Yeah. It was, it was highly functional, but you had... You had to know special tricks or you had to go to a three-day course and sit there in a classroom and listen to someone talking about it. Um, And we wanted something where it was just intuitive. You'd look at the screen and in one click, you could get what you were after. And 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 we still get it today. I still get people coming to me saying, oh, it was so exciting. I had this new staff member start and they didn't do any of the training. They just sat down and they were already able to do a whole bunch of things that they never would have been able to do previously. So that's what we're always aiming for. Yeah. Because if it's easy to use and people get in the habit of using software, there's no point in having software that just sits there in the corner, right? Yeah, definitely. And uh, Elon Musk, uh, I mean, it's always a, a risk to quote ultra successful people, but I'll, I'll, I'll go for it anyway. Uh, he says, if your product requires a, a, a manual, you don't have a product, right? Um, I, I love it. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely. very good, is it? I mean, but I, I feel like only Elon could actually achieve that, you know. Like I was saying, just as just as arrogant. Why not? <laughs> I mean, my, my take on that is that every time we need to look, of course, you, you know, you, you do need training, you do need, you know, help desk, you do need all these things to really get the most out of um, any software. Um, but the way I look at it, any time that we we have to help someone in in what, whatever medium that is. I always, from a product management perspective, I look back and say, well, what could we do better to make it more intuitive, to make it easier for someone to just self-serve and not have to ask for assistance? Um, and that informs a lot of our uh, product design and development, making it so that you don't have to ask for help to, to get what you want. Mm. I mean, in an ideal world, it just all works, right? Yeah, yes. I, I did uh, 12 months consulting at Advisor Ratings, and they do a lot... Of- I sort of helped them develop this product where uh, instead of, well, in addition to consumers rating advisors, right, advisors could then rate products. And I remember looking at all of the results for all the tech. Now, this was across the board, um, and it dawned on me that technology, especially in financial advice, is an extremely difficult environment where you have this volatile, ultra-dynamic requiring massive changes at a rapid pace to keep up with rules and regulations. And on the other side, you have development. And development, unless you have this kind of Silicon Valley, well-run engine like engine room where you've got these two-week rollouts of updates, it's impossible to keep up with all the different demands. And so across the board, tech was very disliked. And how, how did you deal with, I guess, the problems that are inherent in financial advice technology. I'm I'm pleased to say that um, I've seen all that research and and we were, in fact, the least disliked. Hey, uh, high five. Well done. Well done to you. Great. Great. That was a great (laughs) achievement. Um, Look, I mean, I think part of what you're talking about is the fact that what's a financial advisor? There's no two advisors that would describe themselves in the same way. 100%. So everybody's doing something different. Everybody's seeking to differentiate. And they've all got competing, uh, you know, designs and or desires, that what things that they want to see in software. And, yeah. and of course, you can't please all the people all the time. Um, so 
what we're generally going for. I mean, our, our focus has generally been on the IFA. That, that's who we are at heart. That's what we feel comfortable with. That's what we, we've always supported. So we're looking for, for ways to you know, add features, um, simplify options that will apply to as many advisors as possible, as often as possible. Which is, I mean, that's difficult to do, right? It's very difficult to do. And I take my hat off to anyone who even gives it a go. Like when, after looking at those results, I was like, oh, wow. Like, is, is it just that all advisors are grumpy all the time? Or is it, and then I thought about the difficulties with, as you mentioned, no two advisors are, are the same. You go to, you get two different pieces of advice with two different client experiences. Um, and then you've got to somehow, and, and we do, it's not like, we can avoid it. it. Like you do need to then summarize it down into a piece of technology so that your business is workable. So you, this needs, this is a problem that needs to be solved. Um, but it is, yeah, just a very difficult environment. You're right. And, and the fact that uh, the local market isn't exactly, you know, enormous yeah. means that there's a sort of a limited uh, number of people that you, you can sell these. Um, well, how many technically would it be like what five to 10,000 licenses total? In in, in, in in Australia, well, obviously there's twenty thousand advisors, I'm, but you probably there probably aren't twenty thousand decision makers. Sure, that, that's right. Um, yeah. So, but, but still, I mean that's a that's a sizable number. Sure. Um, and I guess that sort of uh, informed um, our decision to accept Morningstar's offer. Yeah. Because it meant that you know we knew that we would have the resources to go and do more of what we've already been doing. Um, and we can leverage all these great people around the world in the organization who are already, already doing work in similar areas that uh, where we don't have to start from scratch all the time. And, and we're able to say yes to, to more things and, and actually sort of uh, rather than just saying yes to everyone's request, actually um, step forward and say, hey, we, we've got these fantastic ideas of what would be great for advisors. Mm. Why don't you take a look at this? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to team up with uh, Morningstar, in my opinion, because Morningstar do this around the world already, right? They have they they, they deal with technology Correct. in different countries, and with, this was sort of a hole that they were, I guess, that they had in this country. Australia is a bit different, though, right? Um, we, I think we have the most advanced advice market in the world in, in many ways. Yeah, um, we certainly have the most onerous legislation uh, and regulation <laughs> yeah. of any advice market in the world. Yes, we have l- l- legislated ethics now. <laughs> Correct. No Correct. one. <laughs> you, you, have you figured out what that means yet? So I did. I, it is an amazing concept that it, that ethics, which is so nebulous, can be legislated. That's cr- like I love the concept of having great ethics, but if ethics can't be enforced on a on a on just a a, a board of ethics for example you mm. know you've got a, a code of ethics that you live by i'm i would just i wonder if legislating those ethics will change the outcome i'm, I'm all for good regulation that serves consumers Same. and gives them a better outcome absolutely uh, um now these these are just my opinions right <laughs> uh, personally I'm not, I'm not representing morningstar on, on this one um but i would say that there are there have been quite a few pieces of legislation over the years um, that haven't really served the consumer. They've increased costs, made it harder for advisors to serve clients, um, and created a whole bunch of red tape. Now, as a software company, we've benefited from some of that. It's, uh, <laughs> That's I'm, a good I'm point. Not complaining entirely. Um, however, I, I wish we were spending more time on um, helping advisors serve their clients better, coach their clients better, um, rather than helping them you know with these very mundane onerous um, compliance obligations that don't necessarily help their clients yeah the legis like every profession has a code of ethics um it's it's i mean but doctors don't even have legislated ethics it's it's a weird concept to me i just haven't wrapped my head around the concept of something that's in law and something that's nebulous and now they're combined so Oh, I'm sure well, it's going to be interesting seeing it roll out. Um, I'm really interested to find out uh, what a, a, what a tech company does to acquire clients. So if I think about the way that advisors used to acquire clients, it was buy a book of business, call them, get them in for a meeting, convert to ongoing client. That was essentially 
then over, I guess, the last less than five years, um, a lot of financial planners have caught on to how the rest of the entire world builds market share, and that is developing online content, building one-way uh, scalable relationships with as many people as possible. Those who don't like you ignore you or maybe in some cases insult you, but largely it's just you get a silent a uh, group of people that follow your stuff uh, and then they just walk through your funnel and that's they know what you do they know who you are and then they walk in and interestingly um, product manufacturers in financial advice are still stuck on the old methodology of acquiring clients so if you think of um, insurance platform fund manager all these sort of bdms they're still acquiring clients in the way that advisors used to acquire their own clients. And there was an analogy there. But advisors have kind of moved on. Products have not. Um, does tech fall into the same basket? Or what did you find or have found to be a great way to build relationships with advisors so they know what you do and then they scope themselves in? Uh, look, to some extent, you're asking the wrong guy. Um, <laughs> our, our strength was always building really usable software. Um, promoting that wasn't wasn't the best. I mean, we we've won just about every investment trends award for many years now. Jesus, um, but there's still only a very small portion proportion of the industry was fully aware of us. So, uh, but I guess now again with with Morningstar, um, our marketing muscles gone from you know someone a couple yeah. of hours a week thinking about it to um, a whole team around the world um, focused on it and able to um, add to it. Look, that said, advisors follow what other advisors say. Um, I was chatting to uh, Dean Holmes yesterday, who I, I know has been um, on, on this podcast before. Yeah. And, um, and and he was saying just that, yeah, look, um, people are out there. People, of course, they read um, trade magazines and they go to conferences. But at the end of the day, who, who do you look to? You look to the advisors that you respect, that, that are doing the things that, that are the, the sort of advisor that you want to be, and you look at what they're doing and how they're doing it, um, and that's and that's how um, word gets spread. So I think word of mouth is probably uh, still still my preferred method, yeah. um, which is not to say that there aren't other good, good ways to help um, get in front of people at a time when they need to make a decision and want to make a decision, uh, but you know we, we prefer to... I've always preferred to be judged on the merits of what we have rather than sort of how good uh, how good a message we could promote out there, um, which maybe you know was to our detriment. But uh, in the end, in the end, it's all worked out, so uh, that's okay. No, I fully, um, I like I, and advertising does feel a bit cheap. In like it can, actually, it can feel. In, anything can. Yeah. Um, anything can feel cheap. I think advertising certainly. Um, has its place. There's no question. I mean, the, half the world is is built. Half of our, most of our economy is built on advertising. If it wasn't 100%. there, we wouldn't be here. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, but is that necessarily always um, the right way to get to advisors for for specific some things? It would be for other things, um, maybe a little less so. Yeah. So where do you see advice headed? So being in tech, I, I assume it's kind of your job to know all the latest rules and regulations that are coming in. What do you see as kind of the next six to 12 months? What does that look like for advisors, do you think? Isn't it over yet? I mean, hasn't, haven't we had enough changes? <laughs> Please, somebody tell me it's, it's, it's done, right? Um, I was in a meeting yesterday um, where RG97 was being discussed, which is about how super funds um, disclose their fees to consumers um, I, I just stopped calling um, ICRs, MERs, and got used to you know the, the new name. There's going to be another another name coming. So look, we just deal with it, don't we? Don't advisors? We're so used to it now. After FSR and FOFA and Clerk this and you know whatever, like we just we just yeah okay another one. We'll just change the way we're working. Um, we'll have to build a new module in the software or make some changes to deal with it. But we just advisors just get on with it. And they do it for the same reason that we keep um, developing the software. I think what I see is IFAs especially, they're just super passionate about clients. They believe that they're adding value to their clients. Um, I think 
maybe on the outside it's not clear, but on the inside of of our profession, uh, it's sort of a it, it, it's a kind of a holy job, right? Like you're doing God's work in 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 a way, um, helping because we know what happens when people don't get get a good advice. What yeah. what can happen to their families? So we know that you know exceptional advice is is definitely um, worth paying for. It's worth getting. So I think that's what keeps advisors advisors going. Uh, yeah, it, advisors. Next year we're we're putting on a tour of events. We do a couple of tours tours every year um this one's going to be sort of flourishing in an adverse environment right so um i think you've kind of nailed on the head exactly the personality trait of an advisor which is someone that wants to you know add a lot of value and a lot of help to people's lives but at the same time like is definitely a fighter like the advisors uh, are definitely some of the most resilient people it, people normally hate to change and advisors wake up between 6 30 and 7 30 there's been two new bloody regulations <laughs> dropped through so that's it it's uh it's crazy um in terms of i mean is it going to be still known as advisor logic or is it going to change to morningstar or what 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 do, do you guys know yet what the messaging is going to be it, it's not 100 percent clear sure because um, it's really fresh right it to, is really fresh yeah <laughs> um, this is sort of uh, my, my first full week in the office so. yeah <laughs> jesus it's um look I mean, the product certainly um is going to continue to be known as advisor logic um we probably will do away with a few of the um sub brands that we that just uh, there were a bit of proliferation over the last couple of years that, that there was this logic and that logic and every other logic. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, but certainly uh, we, we're going to be promoting the fact that we've got the muscle of Morningstar behind us now. Um, and that's going to be really important to development of the product and also the level of service that we're able to deliver to to our clients. Yeah, that's that's going to be huge. I mean, I've sort of been floating around this concept of... Um, being a fintech founder for a uh, quite a few years now um was it called fintech when you kicked off it was not uh, i knew it i knew that it had to be some cool new name what was it called? It, it was just called tech it was called software yeah. and, and, and in fact um when the term fintech came out I, I spent a good couple of years rolling my eyes at all the people you know who were hashtag fintecking everything that they wrote on uh, on linkedin and twitter and whatnot um, but I heard about plan tech now, so maybe we're we're a bit plan tech as well. Whoa, yeah, uh, the new new ones, you know, I I, can't, I certainly can't keep up, but I do know that it's very difficult. I do know because tech in a highly regulated environment is really difficult to do. So, like, man, how did you start? That's a genuine question. Did did you just use all the funds that you had? in the bank or did you get well I, I mean 12 years ago or 10 to 12 years ago whenever you kicked off there was no vcs around at least to my knowledge my wife must really love me <laughs> um we we bootstrapped the whole thing um, wow we, we'd sold the previous business which misses us um a little yep um and we lived on not much for quite a while yeah um and and eventually we started to make this wonderful thing called the profit um and, and that started to grow so uh we got there eventually. Um, it, it was tough. Um, I certainly would have been earning a lot more uh, taking a job somewhere else. But I was persistent and we, we loved what we were doing. We believed in what we were doing. And it's been 20 plus years and I still wake up every morning and I'm excited about the, the possibilities in advice and, and what it means. Yeah, that's a really good point. Me too. Um, when I sold my company a handful of years ago now, um, I knew that I, I didn't want to get too too distant from advice mm. so it xy's kind of allowed uh, myself and um, a couple of the team to stay super connected without being an advisor when you went through product development here's another thing what did what are advisors typically because in my opinion advisors are very comfortable giving feedback like that that's probably the one thing mm -hmm. you know like um I've had some podcasts come out recently that uh, that have garnished more attention than normal, and, and for good reason. Like we're big fans of just speaking to all parts of the industry, but certainly the advisors that disagree with us, even talking to those people, will let us know. Um, what have you found in terms of having advisors 
direct the the product, so to speak. Anyone who knows me will know I'm a very um, direct person. Um, sometimes a little uh, too direct, but uh, not nonetheless. Um, I really appreciate that um, that aspect of, of many advisors that they're more than willing to share their opinions and their feelings. Um, I, I prefer that to people who just you know will, will sit in the corner and say nothing and, and just not let you know what's on their mind. Yeah. Um, look, sometimes we get brilliant ideas from advisors. And in fact, some of our uh, best innovations have come from seeing the way um, advisors are using the software in ways that we hadn't initially in- intended. So the advisors have lots to offer, um, of course, in the development uh, of software. Um, sometimes you've just got to sort of say, look, um, this thing that you're asking for us to build, um, how often are you going to use it? Oh, not that often. Um, and, and how important is it to your business? Well, it's not really that important. It'd just be great if it was there. Well, if you're not going to use it very often, it's not that important and you don't think anyone else is really going to use it. Do you really think that's where we should be diverting our resources when we could be building this other thing which you will use every single day? <laughs> um, so sometimes it's just, you know, people, there's a bit of a recency bias. Like whatever you've thought about most recently is, is what's at the front of mind and what you want to, you know, what you want to see happen. Um, and sometimes we just have to explain that, well, we don't have totally unlimited resources. Um, <laughs> we, we might just have to focus uh, a little more. But that said, you know, a lot of a lot of our good ideas and, and good developments have come from um, uh, advisor ideas. However, uh, no one ever came up to Steve Jobs and said, "Hey, I want you to build me an Apple uh, iPad, please." Um, not that I'm comparing myself to Steve Jobs. I'm, <laughs> I'm just making the point that uh, we can't just be responding to what people are asking for. We 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 need to be looking ahead. And saying, well, this is where things are going. This is, these are the new technologies that are available. Here's where there can be a total paradigm shift. Here's where we could build something totally different that will change the way you see what you do. What do you see as being the number one benefit for advisors who use, uh, who use, you know, one of these CRMs as the corner piece of their business? What What do you think? Like, let's say. I'm a, an advisor who's going out on my own. What would you say would be the number one thing that you've found to be to offer the biggest benefits for something for the least amount of work? It's a super boring answer, Clayton. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm all right with that. Efficiency. Yeah. In the old days, um, advisors would say things like, "I don't really need software," and I'd sort of try to be. I tried to explain to them, well. But it will save you, you've already told me that implementing the software would save you 10 hours a week. 10 hours a week, you know, what could that mean to you? And the response would be, Game oh, of golf. that's just my time, that doesn't cost me anything anyway. Oh. Uh, you know, that, that's not everybody, but there were certainly a number of uh, guys out there like that. Um, I think that's really changed now. People understand that um, it is hard work to service a client. Uh, you can only service um, the number of clients people are able to service seems to be dropping each year. Hundred percent. And if you want to stay profitable and you want to sort of fulfil your societal obligation of, of giving good advice to the greatest number of people, you're going to need to be more efficient. Also, you know, it just makes sense from a business perspective. It just makes a lot of sense. So that's the most obvious one. Uh, obviously, compliance now is at the front of everyone's mind. In the old days, we rarely had an advisor come to us asking about compliance. Um, AFSLs will be talking about it a little bit, um, <laughs> but now um, advisors, some advisors are, are really taking the lead in their licensee and saying, well, look what we're doing is good, but I want to be doing it even better. And they're coming to us to say, well, we want to, we want to disclose even more or disclose it more effectively or whatever it might be. Um, how can you help us do more on the compliance side? Um, so being able to do that efficiently is important and also demonstrating the value of advice um, which is going to be a big theme for us moving forwards is, you know, advisors being able to, it's not enough to give good advice. In fact, that's almost become a commodity. What's most important is that your clients take that advice, right? Oh yeah. Otherwise there's, there's very little value in, in advice that's never executed. So helping and to ensure that the clients understand the value of what they're being told. And, and in fact, understanding what they're being told that the, the ramifications, the consequences, uh, that's a that's a big thing moving forwards. And that's where software can certainly help. Yeah, and I was 
Strangely enough, I, I, I never really got my head around the, the efficiency piece with my own practice. I was so caught up with trialing new, you know, like new things that oftentimes it would just end up with a lot of loose ends. So, okay, actually, I want to trial something different with my client acquisition. I want to trial something different with my uh, you know handling the client up front and ongoing basis that... I probably tried to do more than I probably should have quicker than I probably should have done it. And that's that's a hindsight thing now. Uh, if I look back at it now, the advisors that I see do this the best sort of set up a project and it's on like a 90-day project and I'm going to focus on one thing in, in doing this better. And it does not surprise me that compliance is now one of those the amount of conversations I've had with advisors who are realizing now that the protections that they probably thought they had in terms of licensees and and such that would come to the rescue in the event that, that there was something wrong are, aren't designed to do that. They are designed to deliver a service that's going to help the majority of advisors the majority of the time, which makes perfect sense. Like there's no, there's no reason why I would think any differently. Um, And, but it is on the individual advisor to make sure that what they are doing is compliant because they're the ones in the business every single day. And so if they're reading the Corpse Act or if they're reading stuff from Fazia and they're putting together an opinion on actually this, is wrong and this is right it doesn't surprise me at all to hear that advisors are are taking that on as a responsibility more and more now because that's definitely where the market has shifted absolutely so there's a couple of points i'd make there um the first one is that previously we would see what was most common was that advisors would select their licensee based on whatever was cheapest or what you know whatever gave them the greatest volume bonus or whatever it might be, that is not happening anymore. Um, advisors are far more concerned with value um, and, and risk. You know, who, who is this licensee? Who are the other advisors? How is this licensee monitoring the advice? What, what totally. Is, you know, because great, maybe I can save 5% going somewhere else, but if that means that they're going to blow up my business, how much is that going to cost me? And, you know, before it didn't really ever seem like a risk. Now it seems like much more of a risk. So post royal commission things are quite different. Um, back to the previous point you were making, I guess for us it's a double-edged sword that IFAs tend to be early adopters. <laughs> so, and of course I am as well. I'm kind of obsessed with the, all all the new tech, and sometimes it does make sense to jump in. Um, and if if no one was ever willing to do that, we never would have gotten off the ground. Um, so thank God for our early adopters. Some of them ten years later are still clients, um, and uh, and I love them. But you can do too much. You can get too focused on perfection. Um, and the IFA's job is not to spend half their life researching tech and, and putting together the ultimate tech stack because the ultimate tech stack is going to change in two days anyway. Well, that was the point I was making earlier. Yeah, because especially such a dynamic environment. Something, something that works and where you understand the, your relationship with that business where you understand that they have a similar commitment to you um, moving forward to technology. And actually, this goes for an AFSL as much as it does for a, a tech provider. That's the important decision to make. It's not about actually, it's probably less about the technology of the day. It's more about, is that is that company a partner for me? Do they understand my values? As an advisor, are they moving in the same direction that I am? Uh, because you'll have a much greater chance of being able to influence influence them as they develop their products and you know that the other people they're speaking to will um will be having similar ideas that you're having and will be uh pushing that company in a similar direction so yeah it's great um it's great to look at uh, new opportunities integrations great we've, we've you know we've invested a lot in in our apis um in, in tools like zapier which you know let our users integrate well over a thousand other applications um into advisor logic but at the end of the day, Advisor Logic or you know your, your financial planning software is the thing that's open on your desktop most of the day, and that's where you really live. 
um, and, and that's where the focus uh, should be most of all, I would say. Yeah. Is that a bit self-serving? I mean, no, no, <laughs> not at all, not at all. No, um, I mean, that's why we get people like you on because it's not often I get to talk to someone who's built a financial services tech company, a fintech company. Mm. <laughs> Hashtag fintech. Like Hashtag. Hashtag. <laughs> totally. Well, mate, uh, congratulations on your um, recent partnership with Morningstar. I can only imagine what that must feel like, what the changes will come. You know, you've gone from, you know, building your own team to being part of a global awesome team that is Morningstar. Massive congratulations to you and thanks so much for um, sort of sharing your views on advice and and how advisors can work with tech. Um, If there's an advisor that wants to reach out to you, uh, what's the best best methodology? Uh, they can call me. They can email me. I'm I'm definitely on LinkedIn. <laughs> so just look me up on LinkedIn, and uh, and you can message me anytime. Mate, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks very much. Cheers.